Welcome everybody to another session in the Head Acoustics Educational Webinar Series. My name is Jacob Sonnegard and I will be your host today. Today's topic is all about noise simulation methodologies and we have quite a lot of information that we would like to share with you. Let's take a look at our proposed agenda for today. What we would like to go through is take you through a little bit of a time travel when back to simpler times when acoustics was just as complicated but we didn't have as many fancy tools and so we'll talk about some of the simple noise generation methods but then very quickly get into some of the more rigorous and scientific approaches which will include taking a good long look at the ES202 396-1 setup from about 2005 timeframe, so the mid 2000s. People got together, standardized an approach using four speakers and a subwoofer to play back binaural sounds. That'll be our first reference case. From there, we'll jump into another Etsy standard called TS103224, which comes to us from about 2014 timeframe and gives us a an evolution or an improvement over the previous method where we now use eight microphones for the recording and the equalization and then we use eight loudspeakers for the playback the big introduction uh, with that stage is the introduction of phase equalization during the playback and then finally just recently 2000 17 2018 time frame ITU got together and looked at the method from at CTS 103224 and said there has to be a way we can adopt this uh, what they call um, multi uh, multi microphone simulation system into an automotive cabin and that ended up being standardized in many of the P1100 series standards uh, as Annex F, and we'll go into detail uh, how that's done and what it means for you guys. Then we'll put, we'll wrap it up, put a nice big bow on it, and get you guys on your way. So, first things first. The whole idea behind background noise reproduction is to put your device under test into an environment where we can accurately stress the noise suppression algorithm or the active noise cancellation algorithms in your product. And I don't think it has to be said how important that is. If you go down to your local car dealership, at least here in the US, you can look at even fairly low end models, somewhere around $15,000, $20,000, and find a halfway decent um, hands-free calling system baked in standard option no extra money required which includes noise suppression so from an automotive standpoint this is something that is pretty much in every single vehicle now you'll find noise suppression in all hands-free systems likewise with mobile phones and if we talk active noise cancellation that's something that a lot of the companies that do personal audio devices have also included even mobile phones have some form of active noise cancellation so suffice it to say that noise suppression and noise cancellation is something that is pretty much everywhere and if you've ever had the ability to switch off noise suppression and be in a call you'll know that the other line the other end of the line will not appreciate a phone call without noise suppression it is incredibly stressful and difficult for the other side to interpret and have a clean conversation. So that presents us with a couple of options. Primarily, if we want to impose some background noise on our device, we take our device with us to somewhere particularly noisy, the side of a road, a cafe or a pub or wherever. And then we start doing our testing in that environment. Uh, the alternative, which we are very much proponents of, is to be able to record certain background noise environments, realistic background noise environments, but then 
recreate those background noises back in your lab. I think, obviously, it's nice to be able to validate your work in the real world. But you think about how something like a tuning job would have to be done in the real world, and it just doesn't make sense. You have zero control over the noise environment and the reproducibility of that noise environment. So it doesn't really allow allow you to do that iterative tuning process. And of course, every time you have to go into the field, there's a lot of logistics involved with it. There's a lot of human error that could potentially influence the measurement. So the thing that we're talking about today is how do we take, how do we record these background noises? How do we take them back to the lab and how do we recreate them so that we ensure that the noises that we are recreating or simulating are as close to the real noise environment as possible. So a quick note, uh, commercial surround sound systems, if you guys have a nice home audio system, they can sound great, but they're just not appropriate for engineering type applications. So a lot of the commercial surround systems are tuned specifically by people that get paid a fair amount of money to make it very uh, immersive and make it very subjectively uh, appealing. And it's supposed to work with particular audio tracks that aren't necessarily true recordings. These are recordings that are engineered and manufactured to invoke an experience and a reaction from a person. Now, of course, our device, our communication device, will not care about anything related to emotions. What that device will care about is how does the noise suppressor function in this environment and ideally this environment that we're creating should be equal to what it will see in the real world. So back in the good old days when dinosaurs roamed the earth, people were obviously looking to stress their brand new technology, noise suppression technology that started coming around in the 90s. And so obviously the quick solution is let's take a couple speakers, set it up in a room, maybe four speakers, one in each corner, and let's play out some white noise or pink noise. And for those that were a little bit sophisticated, let's look at some room equalization and apply that in advance. Obviously, without any standards written around it, we see that there are quite a few limitations here. First and foremost, we don't really know what type of reproducibility we could get from one lab to another. So if you're working with a vendor or you as a vendor may be creating a noise suppression algorithm and you're working with a mobile phone manufacturer or a car radio manufacturer, there's no guarantee that any of the testing you're doing will correspond to the testing that they're doing. And so the results aren't really comparable. Another thing is, Without the standardization involved, we have no control over what noise levels or frequency content was displayed, what the room could have been done, and even what type of speakers were used if they weren't equalized in advance. And I think the most important thing to mention is with these relatively simple noise tracks, so the white noise or the pink noise or even the hoth noise, is that they do not expose your device under test to real world conditions, right? If you step out onto the street or, uh, and you're standing in a street corner trying to make a phone call on your mobile phone, then the noises that you hear out there, trucks and buses, cars, maybe other people walking by chatting, is nowhere near white noise or pink noise, right? There's no transients involved in white noise or pink noise. The crest factor is low unlike the real world. So the audio file down here is really just a white noise or a pink noise file, nothing too interesting, but the point is we can do better than simply playing back white noise and pink noise. And fortunately, we have. So let's take a jump out to 2005 timeframe where the Etsy group got together and said, we need something that is standardized, that's easy for people to set up, doesn't necessarily require a million dollar chamber and a boatload of speakers, but we need something that's consistent and accurately reproduces the magnitude across frequency 
so that we can play back background noises as if we were out in the real world. And so the ES202-396-1 was published to address that issue. At a minimum, it requires a nice, relatively quiet room, about 30 uh, dB SPL, A-weighted, background noise or ambient noise in the room. It requires four speakers and a subwoofer, where we apply some delay and equalization. And then it requires some background noise files that we play back and reproduce a relatively diffuse sound field. So if we look at the methodology on the next slide, you'll see that the first step we want to do in this process, according to the standard, is we want to dial in the level of each loudspeaker so that the output is roughly going to be the same from each of the four speakers in the corners. Then we will equalize the loudspeakers in pairs for the room acoustics or the commercial or the consumer product people in the audience you guys will be used to equalizing first the left hand side speakers or the pair and then afterwards the right hand loudspeakers as a pair once we have some rough fir filters for each of those to get a roughly flat response at the head and torso we'll apply some delay compensation to avoid the worst of the standing waves in the room. And then we'll do an equalization and level adjustment for the subwoofer. So to make sure we get all the sub 120 hertz sounds primarily, down to about 50 hertz is where we cut off in the standard. That's the requirement on the low end 50 hertz. And then finally, we'll take all four speakers in unity plus the sub, and we'll make sure that when all of these speakers are playing at the same time, that the level at the head and torso is going to be flat. And then sort of the final step of that is we want to verify that any sound reproduced in the sound field matches what was recorded originally. And from that, we've equalized a room, and we can now choose any of our binaural recordings so this is again for the consumer guys any of our binaural recordings we can choose and then inject into the system with the appropriate fir filters delays uh, ir filters etc and ensure that that binaural recording is going to have the same level at the head and torso ears as it did when we did the original record now I've talked a lot about binaural recordings, and that is because for the consumer guys, that is our source material. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about most consumer products being placed near the ear of the head and torso. So a mobile phone, a headset, or an accessory that goes on your head, it can be, or it should be, tested near the head and torso. So we wanted to capture, or the standardization group wanted to capture background noises near the head and torso, and then feed it through the system and the process that we just talked about. So we have a separate set of equalization filters for the left speakers and the right speakers and the sub. We make sure we have the correct delays and so on. Now, we did have a separate session entirely dedicated to chambers for telecom testing so i don't want to spend too much time on this but take a mental screenshot of this slide and you can quickly figure out roughly how big or how small should your chamber be in general on the small side we just want to ensure that we have enough distance between the speakers in the corner of the room and the head and torso in the middle so that we don't end up with too much directional sound remember we want to create a diffuse environment and on the far side, we don't want to get too far away from the head and torso either to where we can't generate enough SPL out of each speaker. The bigger thing, so usually people can find a, a room or a chamber that fits those requirements. But the bigger thing is probably to uh, 
find a chamber that fits the overall RT60 time. This is the primary requirement for the Etsy ES202396-1 setup. So the RT60 time has to be between 200 and 700 milliseconds when we look at the frequency range 100 hertz to 8K. So doing an RT60 measurement is not super sophisticated. So if you have any doubts, if you adhere to the standard, it's pretty quick to do the measurement to validate that. Now, as I mentioned early on, one of the ideas here was to not require people to invest in hugely expensive chambers. The idea here is for telecom testing that we really want to be able to capture basically any empty office room and then perhaps with a little bit of acoustic dampening materials, so carpeting or on the walls or ceiling tiles, we should be able to tweak and tune the room to fit our need and then be used for background noise testing for telecommunications. So the requirements aren't that strict. So if you wanted to see a head acoustics implementation of the system, this is how we would go about it. On the left-hand side, you'll find either something like Aqua or Vocas for telecom or speech recognition testing. And then on the right-hand side, you'll find the what we call HAEBGN, but that is the Etsy implementation where we apply the different filters and delay coefficients and control each speaker pair. Now, I know this room is drawn up to look like it has wedges. Remember, that's not technically a requirement by the standard. So the bigger question is, where is ES202396-1 used? The short answer, pretty much everywhere. So the mobile phone guys were the first to really jump on this solution. Those were the guys that were really clamoring for a better standardized approach for testing noise suppression algorithms in their products. So 3GPP and Etsy are kind of the big uh, mobile phone communities, international communities, but even things like GSMA adopted this method as well. So the GSMA, they are the uh, owners of the HD Voice and the HD Voice Plus spec. So if you've ever been on a wideband call on your mobile phone and the mobile phone has otherwise been tested up against the GSMA spec, you might notice a little HD Voice logo somewhere on your screen or it may be even be used on the packaging of the device to advertise with that product. In any case, you'll also see you know, the VoIP guys and the proprietary VoIP group, uh, Skype, so owned by Microsoft, has adopted this as well. And you'll notice that ITU, P1100 and 1110, adopted this method as well, although there's some slight modifications I'll talk about in general. So when I say it's adopted nearly everywhere, it is true. It goes across all types of industries. Just for reference, let me play you quick snippets of what the background noise sounds like. At the top, I'll have some pub noise, and at the bottom, I'll have some driving noise. If you are listening to this webinar via headphones, it would have sounded just like you were at the pub, or just like you were driving. I'm, of course, being a little facetious here because, A, we're just playing a single channel, and who knows what GoToWebinar is doing to our audio stream. But the idea is this is an actual pub environment recorded with actual people, and likewise at the bottom, an actual vehicle driving 130 kilometers an hour or 80 miles an hour, so that when a product is put into that sound field, bang, it'll sound exactly like or it'll think it is exactly in that environment. To an extent, because there are, of course, some limitations. The biggest one might be that we don't have any uh, of the spatial characteristics 
included in the playback. Remember, the whole goal here was to create a diffuse environment. And that works OK for some applications. But as devices have gotten more sophisticated since 2005 timeframe, it is important that spatial information is included in order to test things like multiple microphone devices or uh, directional microphones or beamforming applications, etc. There's a lot of sophisticated processes and constructions that require more sophisticated background noise, which includes the spatial resolution, and that is not included in ES202396-1. Another thing is we quote unquote only equalize the magnitude over the frequency ranges 50 hertz to 10k. There may be cases where we want the magnitude equalized all the way out to 20k. And another big one at the bottom, you'll see that, remember, these are binaural recordings typically captured with a, the ears of a head and torso. What does that mean when you have to recreate that sound field for the speakerphone hands-free situation or the handheld speakerphone situation? All of a sudden, during the equalization process, you're going to have to move your head and torso onto the tabletop or lay the head and torso on the tabletop to create the equalization point and then move the head and torso back and put your product in that sound field. It doesn't quite work very well. And that is one of the big limitations with ES202396-1. It doesn't work particularly well for those handheld, hands-free applications. So quick note about the automotive implementation, so the P1100 series, uh, because they aren't necessarily interested in binaural recordings, they're just interested in a single channel recording captured near the in-vehicle mic. The approach is otherwise identical, except the automotive community will then equalize the front speakers first and the back speakers afterwards, and they only have a single channel for the playback that has to go back over the four channels plus a sub. So the implementation is slightly different, but fundamentally it's the same system. Now, if you wanted to validate your background noise implementation, we do have a couple of techniques that we can recommend. The first one is from IEEE, so 269, the IEEE 269 revision 2010. They have a nice method for validating the diffusivity of a sound field. And remember, for Etsy ES202396-1, we were focused on creating a diffuse environment. So the fundamental idea behind the IEEE standard is you measure within a very small radius and you take a microphone and rotate it in different points and then you're able to figure out well how diffuse is the sound field really within this tiny radius that's essentially what we're trying to achieve with the sound field reproduction technique and this is what IEEE allows us to validate another one is from the mobile phone community where we use the three quest algorithm in sort of a hacked together approach. It's actually pretty clever. Um, so if you, you recall a previous session where we talked about three quest, where we typically have the clean, the unprocessed and the processed signal that we feed into our algorithm, what the mobile phone guy says, Hey, we can, we can manipulate that a little bit and we can put a, reference mic at the MRP. So remember for the validation here, we're not interested in any product, we're just interested in validating the sound field. So we take our reference mic and we put it at the mouth reference point. And then we capture, we still have our clean speech material of course, but then we capture the signal at the mouth reference point, which will be treated as the process signal. And then we use the right ear of the head and torso, which is in our sound field, and we capture that with the independent of direction EQ filter, 
so the ID EQ. And we capture that as the unprocessed filter. And we take those three signals and feed it into the algorithm to get some reference scores that regardless of which room, which chamber you're in, you should always get roughly that three quest score, so the SMOS, NMOS, and GMOS, for each of the standardized samples of noise that comes with ES202396. So I didn't mention this earlier, but I think you guys are aware and familiar with the standard to where you can go and download the, I believe it's 16 different noise scenarios that comes with the standard. So to give you an example of the reference scores, you can see each of them listed here, each of the noise files plus the quiet condition, where the reference SMOS and NMOS scores have been generated using the hack together three quest approach we just talked about. And you can see for both narrow band and wide band, obviously the clean or the quiet conditions will score higher. But it's good that you have these scores because if you are questioning whether the room you have set up is correct, A, you can do basic fundamental things like checking your RT60 times and your ambient noise level. That's one you should do. Two, you can look at the IEEE standard to see is the environment right around my head and torso or the sweet spot, is it diffuse? Or three, use the three quest algorithm and a reference mic at the MRP and then double check with the standard. Do you get the same SMOS and NMOS scores? And if so, you can have every confidence in the world that your room fulfills the standard and any data you take in there with a real product will correspond to anybody else who also fulfills the standard. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the big limitation about ES202396-1 is the fact that we don't get the spatial characteristics of the sound field played back to us. So while uh, the previous standard has been around since 2005, and it's tightly integrated into a lot of standards, people still got together, Etsy still got together almost 10 years later and said, we need something that is better. Devices are getting smarter. We need something that is smarter on the playback side as well. And they came up with a system that uses eight microphones in an array and eight loudspeakers for the playback. And the idea being we can capture level versus frequency, but also phase versus frequency. And we can equalize for both level and phase, meaning if we have phase, we can get the spatial information. So I can't emphasize this enough. I'm going to emphasize it a couple more times. But it means a typical setup would look like this. On the head and torso, so in some ways the head and torso just becomes a very fancy microphone holder. Because if you look closely, you can see we have a array on the head and torso with the eight microphones. They are right side or right hand dominated. So out of the eight mics, you'll find five of them on the right hand side. And then the remaining three are sort of towards the front and around the left side. And then you have eight speakers staggered in height in a circle around the head and torso. Now let's look at some of the processes here. The first step is Again, we want to dial in the SPL of each loudspeaker. So we want to hit roughly 70 dB SPL, A, to get enough SNR in the playback, and B, so that the software just has to do less compensation for individual gains in the loudspeakers. We want to dial them in beforehand. Second step is we do something called system identification, and it's basically creating our 8 by 8 matrix. So we measure the impulse response from each speaker. So speaker number one plays out an impulse response or a sweep. And then from microphone one, we'll capture the response there to get the first element in the matrix. And then from the same speaker, we'll also capture mic two and mic three and mic four, etc. And we start to build up our 8 by 8 matrix. The third step is we will apply appropriate filters and cutoffs so that we're only looking at the primary 
signal content of interest. And then the fourth step, this is where sort of the, the magic happens, is we invert all of those impulse responses. And then we combine them in the different frequency bands with the appropriate weighting. Once we do the matrix inversion filters, we can apply those to each of the loudspeakers. We'll do a optimization step and finally a validation. So this is all done. This is relatively sophisticated mathematics that software will typically handle for you. But it is a lot more sophisticated because we now include phase information and time domain information in the EQ phase, unlike before. So the validation procedure for what we call three pass or the Etsy TS103224 uh, method is to play uncorrelated noise without any filters applied at what we call the original position and then we can rotate the eight microphone array by 10 degrees and essentially capture an additional eight points. That's what we call the rotated position. So it's, it's a pretty clever way of gaining 16 mic positions using, using eight microphones. But what that allows us to do is later on, not just validate the sweet spot for each of those eight discrete locations by rotating it by 10 degrees, we get a lot greater confidence that the sweet spot is actually pretty uniform across the whole microphone array. So anyway, once we've captured the um, uncorrelated noise signals without any filters applied, we will move our array back to the original position and we will play back the noise with our filters that we calculated from the matrix inversion step. We'll play back the noise and then we will record that at both the uh, original position and the rotated position. And we compare the actual recorded signal with filters to what the simulated response should be or what the calculated response should be. So we can calculate our way out of it and then we measure our way out of it to see how good is the filter implementation and the real world implementation. And we look at the delta between the two to validate whether our system is functional and operational. Now, once again, big question, where is TS-103224 used? Primarily, it is the 3GPP mobile phone standards that have adopted it. It is used as a recommended method for the handset position, but as of, I believe it's revision 14 of the TS-26-132, 131-132 standard, it is now recommended for the handheld hands-free situations because of some of the limitations we talked about in the past with the binaurally captured method. Now, I do have some sound files here that we can play back if we wanted to. The idea is just to show you some different noise scenarios. In this case, I have a crossroad noise file. And again, I have a pub noise uh, file that I'll just play a couple seconds of so you can get a sense of what they sound like. So both of these noise scenarios are actually quite interesting because they both include a lot of directional elements. So the top one with the crossroad, I hope I played it long enough for you guys to detect that there was a vehicle coming by. Uh, but the idea is you're standing at an intersection of a road and 
not only do you have general traffic and car noise, which is relatively low frequency dominated, you can see that from the frequency response on the bottom half of the plot, but you also get the movement in the sound field. And so when you play that back, your product has to get maybe a little bit sophisticated about not only the frequency content, but also the difference in the origination or the direction of the sound. And of course, pub noise, we're familiar with that. Lots of people, lots of transients, lots of noise. Now, it's not all roses because there are still some limitations. Number one is that while we do aim to equalize the phase in the 103224 standard, there is a cap on it of about three kilohertz on the phase equalization. Now, to be fair, for today's products, today's generation of products, phase information out to 3K is still going to accurately stress things like active noise canceling circuitry, beam formers, noise suppressing algorithms. A lot of those work lower than 3K in the frequency domain. And so it is sufficient and good enough to fool a modern product, at least by 2018 standards. However, maybe when we get together in five years or in 10 years, the standards will have evolved because you guys have evolved the products that are available on the market and this is no longer sufficient. But what that means is if you actually sit yourself into the sound field and you are listening to it, yeah, you get a good sense of obviously the levels. You get a good sense of the uh, the mobile nature of the sounds where that is relevant, so in the crossroad one. But what you might occasionally incur is an image flip of the noise field because a lot of the phase in information above 3K is disregarded in the playback of this method. But our brains obviously work beyond that, beyond 3K. And so as a human being, eh, sometimes it, you get a little confused with the imaging of the playback. But for a product out to 3K, it's generally not considered an issue at all. It's just a limitation to be aware of going forward. And another thing, because the eight microphone array is relatively, it is not relatively, it is very specifically defined and specified, we also have limitation when it comes to the size of the device under test. Because we are really only equalizing within that radius of the microphone array. It's a little bit bigger than the head of the head and torso. So you can imagine roughly how big your product needs to be before we run into issues. So one of the biggest things is if you're working on things like uh, distributed mic locations, so you have a product that includes satellite mics, or you have something like a sound bar where you have a linear array that is spread way beyond the width of the array. Those types of applications this system will still only allow you to equalize within the array and so each of your microphones in that particular physical configuration won't be exposed to accurate background noise and therefore during the playback if you have things like noise suppression applied across multiple mics or beamforming algorithms it's not going to be an accurate scenario for those types of applications so that's something to be mindful of now Quick side-by-side, -side. again, just take a mental snapshot, refer to this when required. But the bottom line is the ES202396-1 standard that uses the four speakers plus a sub. It's been around for a long time. It's embedded in a lot of standards. People still refer to it. They still use it. It's still a good standard, but there are limitations primarily with frequency ranges not being as high as desired, and there's no phase information included in the playback. On the right hand side, the TS103224 uses eight mics and eight speakers. We do get spatial information. We can equalize out to 20K. Uh, it's just a lot more modern and appropriate for today's environments, but there are some limitations in that the phase information cuts off at 3K and we can't fit large products within the size of the array. And so it wouldn't be suitable for those types of products. Now, let's get to the latest 
revision in the standards community. So the multi-point noise simulation, the MPNS method, that's the one that's described in TS-103-224 using the eight microphones. That's the one that ITU looked at and said, there's got to be a way that we can use that fundamental concept and apply it particularly or specifically to the automotive application. And they were able to figure out a very nice solution for it. The whole motivation behind this is in the automotive community, uh, the hands-free and, well, I guess both the OEMs and Tier 1, Tier 2 suppliers are looking at not only using directional mics, but also multiple mics. And those multiple mics could either be relatively closely spaced in tight beamforming configurations, or they could be relatively far apart, something like having a single microphone above the driver and a single microphone above the passenger in the front seat for hands-free communication. And the limitation with the old Etsy standard was, of course, you could only equalize at one point at the same time, and there was no phase information. So if you look in Annex F of the latest P1100 suite of standards, they're free to download. You can hit the link, go download it. You can see that they've taken and, and referred to the Etsy TS-103224 standard for multi-point noise simulation and said, the idea we want is we want at least four loudspeakers that's what we're used to but we want the option to include more we want um, so at a, as a minimum we require at least as many loudspeakers as we have microphones now in the past we used one microphone in a vehicle and we had four plus one loudspeakers on the playback what the new standard is saying, in theory, you could have four reference microphones for the recording and the equalization process and four loudspeakers for the playback. However, the recommended is really a factor of two. So the recommended setup is we want to have, let's say, two microphones in the vehicle and four loudspeakers for the playback, but we can go as high as 10 speakers. And the trick or the benefit is the more speakers you can cram into that vehicle the more individual sound sources you get the more information the background noise simulation software has to work with in order to get you more phase information so playing around with this i've seen systems that's able to get phase information equalized at multiple locations out to 12 kilohertz which is quite impressive but that's using something like three reference microphones and eight loudspeakers, for instance. So it has slightly higher requirement for the amount of speakers and the amount of mics. But the point is the system is flexible and can accommodate whatever your cabin environment is in your vehicle or in your hands-free system. Now, of course, because everything is going to be flexible and custom, we don't have a defined set of noise recordings because we don't know where you will place those one two three four five reference microphones in your vehicle and we don't know how many speakers you'll use in the playback so there's no way for the standards community to get together and say here's a standard bank of files noise files so for this system you now have to go and record your own noise files now in the automotive community Fair enough, not a big deal because the automotive community is used to recording individual files because each vehicle is different anyway. But those of you in the consumer space, you're probably looking at this thinking, hey, this might be neat for those applications that we talked about earlier, conferencing systems with satellite or distributed mics, sound bars, um, teleconferencing, telepresence systems, and in general, just multiple Let's say you have multiple smart speakers in a room and you want to equalize that both of them to figure out how do they behave simultaneously or when they're both active. That's exactly where this ITU standard can now be adopted back into the consumer space and where we've seen very positive and good results. And just as long as you adhere to the similar rules for the amount of microphones and the amount of speakers, then the system will work for you and generate accurate level so at a minimum we'll give you out to 10k but 
we aim to, to provide a equalized response out to 20 kilohertz in the in magnitude. And for phase, it really depends on the amount of mics and the amount of speakers. At a minimum, I believe the cutoff by the standard is 1.5K for the phase reproduction. At a minimum. But um, the more speakers you have, and the greater the ratio between mics to speakers, then the higher the chance of getting much better phase information during the playback. So it's always a recommendation to go as high as you can. Now, the method and the process here is sort of a mix between the two previous standards. But you want to take uh, reference microphones and you want to place them as close to the DUT mics. So you can see that we have mocked up a cabin here, vehicle cabin, where we assume we have a hands free microphone above the driver, we have a hands free microphone above the passenger, and let's say we have a beamforming array in the center console. And so we essentially have three discrete locations, but we maybe want a little bit more phase information at this location. So we double up or actually triple up on the reference mics. So we capture multiple locations with multiple microphones. Then we place up to 10 speakers in our environment. And then we go through the same process, the matrix inversion to calculate FIR filters and IR filters, etc., as described in TS-103224. And then at a minimum, we'll get phase equalized. So if the equalization process is successful, we will get phase equalized to, at a minimum, 1.5 kilohertz, but potentially higher. And the end goal or the result is that we have an equalized sound field that is equalized at multiple locations that includes the phase information. So this is actually something that's incredibly flexible and incredibly powerful when we think about hopefully the next line of products coming out the next five to ten years so this is something that should be able to sustain us for quite a while so make sure you go to the IT website download p1100 or 1110 or 1120 and look in annex F so for the automotive guys you can also see 1140 includes it although you'll have to look in annex B for that 1140, of course, is the e-call standard or the emergency call, <clears throat> but it is included in there as well. So let's wrap this guy up. Number one, I think everyone agrees it is important or critical, rather, that we have good background noise reproduction so that we can validate the performance of our noise suppression. And it doesn't matter if you're making a mobile phone, an automotive hands-free system, or a speech recognition system. Those systems have to be validated for noisy conditions. It's no fun testing a speech recognition system in a, in a clean, quiet condition in an anechoic chamber. You should probably have pretty good success with that, but nobody uses a speech recognition system in an anechoic chamber. So you need to introduce background noise into your system. Now, the good old days, we had some suggestions and approaches, and they were a start. Let's put it that way. But then the, the international communities got together and said we need something a little bit more standardized. That's when we see in 2005, it's really the first standard to really uh, suggest a good approach, and that's the ES202396-1. And it is still today, in 2018, the most common methodology available. It is still across all different industries and standards. Now, the newer approaches, dating to 2014 through 2017, include that multipoint noise simulation, the MPNS method first standardized in etsy ts103224 and later slightly adapted and adopted by the itu community for the automotive market but the whole idea is a we get phase information 
B, we can equalize out to 20K. And C, when it comes to the uh, ITU, multipoint noise simulation method, we can overcome those dimensional constraints that we had in the past using the Etsy standard with the 8 mic configuration as it was. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and your attendance and your attention. Have a wonderful day, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot.